Hello, Minasan and Konnichiwa. We met last Friday for IJBC's second online lecture series, which was with Dr. Rabindar Mili, President of Discover India Club. As we all know, we are celebrating 70th anniversary of diplomatic relationship between India and Japan. IJBC is organizing online lectures, panel discussions, fireside chat with Shifali, and of course, the most av awaited event, which is Konnichiwa Pune 2022, which is supported by Embassy of Japan, Delhi, Consulate General of Japan in Mumbai, Government of India, India Japan Laboratories, and KU University, sponsored by Tutor Bharat and La Interjust India. For more details and to watch our prior sessions, please do visit on our website www.ijbc.org. I would request everyone to please keep off, uh, keep their mics off. So we are here back again with our special lecture series in collaboration with IJL. India Japan Laboratories. Our first session will offer a rare confluence of observation and assessment by the career diplomats and experts in the international relations. The speakers have witnessed the historical development of bilateral uh, relations between India and Japan. The speakers are Ambassador Sanjay Kumar Verma, Ambassador of India to Japan, Ambassador Hiroshi Hirabayashi, former Ambassador to India and France, Chairman of JFSS. Professor Thani, uh, Tomohiko Thaniguchi, Special Advisor to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's cabinet. So we have, uh, we will also have question and answer session after each and uh, each every speakers for five to seven minutes. Only questions are requested. And if you have any comment or any suggestions, please share it in chat box. And if time permits, we will also have question and answer session after the complete session as well. So I will now introduce to our popular moderator, Ms. Tomo Khawane, senior researcher at KU University and independent consultant. Khawane-san, those who are here, the stage is yours. Hi, Dandashiri-san, arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you for attending this webinar today. I'd like to welcome you all from Indo-Japan Business Council of Pune and India-Japan Laboratory of Keio University, Japan. We are very much honored to welcome the eminent speakers for our first session to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the diplomatic relationship between India and Japan. First of all, I would like to request Professor Rajiv Shaw, Director of India-Japan Laboratory, Keio University, and Professor of Graduate School of Media and governance, please. Thank you very much and namaskar. Uh, thank you, it's an honor and privilege to start this uh, particular lecture series uh, with uh, IJBC uh, and IJL. Uh, IJL is the India Japan Laboratory. Many of you possibly are not aware about what is IJL. So just uh, allow me to say a few words about this India-Japan laboratory in Keio University. Uh, it was formed uh, almost uh, three years back in 2019 uh, to promote our bilateral collaboration between our two countries in different field, uh, starting from technology, culture, development, political relationship, etc. And over the last three years, and this has been actually, I will say, a tough journey, but as well as an enriching journey, tough journey in the sense that it was all through the COVID period. We established in 2019 in December, we were planning many face-to-face -face event in 2020, and then COVID had actually stopped us to make any face-to-face -face event. I had lots of plan to bring our students to India, to bring Indian students to Japan, but everything had to stop. So we actually changed lots of our activities into online uh, connection and online collaboration. But we tried to, uh, we worked with several Indian universities also and to collaborate different um, areas of mutual interest. And also very recently we have formed uh, what we call the India-Japan Collaborative Platform. In, uh, in Hindi, we call this Injan Pulia. Injan is India and Japan. And Pulia, some of you who knows that this particular term, it calls about small, small bridge, small bridge in the village area. 
And in the village, this type of small bridge are very, very critical actually. It's a lifeline for those villages. And that was, it was actually the idea came from uh, Kawane-san and uh, Kawane-san's husband gave this particular word uh, of this pulia. Uh, and uh, this, we wanted to make at least this small connection of youth to youth participation in the both countries and which is not just in form of event, but which also remains after the event. So the real connectivity, and that was our main passion of doing this whole India-Japan laboratory. And we are really privileged and honored to have many eminent speaker in this whole lecture series. We will have six of them. And today uh, we are starting with our Ambassador Verma. We have Ambassador Hirabayashi. I mean, there can't be a better person than Ambassador Hirabayashi to tell us about the history of this relationship um, and like from the from the cold relationship, how it became this type of warm and vibrating relation. I think that's the history which we'll be uh, looking at. Also, Professor Taniguchi, who is my colleague in KO, but also the main person behind PM Abe's speech in Indian Parliament, uh, who coined this whole concept of this Indo-Pacific collaboration. And the importance is becoming actually increasing uh, increasingly high uh, in this particular uh, geopolitical context. So we will have similar esteemed speaker in the future lecture series as well. Uh, and I wanted to thank all of you uh, to join and listen to this. And we'd like to also get your feedback uh, on this particular series. Also, not only just these six topics, but if you have any specific topics in your mind where you think that it will be good to have some uh, this type of joint collaborative uh, uh, series. Uh, so we'd like to get that type of feedback as well and very much look forward to that. And finally, on behalf of IJL, I'd like to sincerely thanks to our co-organizer IJBC, means without them, it would not have been possible, especially <laughs> Siddharthji, the president of IJBC, uh, Abhishekji, vice president, and our main pulia, the bridge, Kawanesan, uh, who <laughs> belongs to both IJL and IJBC to make this happen. I very much look forward to this series, but also our future collaboration between IJBC and IJL. Thank you very much and namaste. Thank you so much for quite encouraging, lovely opening. Uh, now I'd like to invite Mr. Siddharth Desmukh, the president of India, uh, Indo-Japan Business Council, please. Namaste and konnichiwa, everyone here. My name is Siddharth Deshmukh, and it's, it's really a privilege to host all the dignitaries, not only for this opening session of IJBC, IJL special series, but uh, throughout this year until December, we planned six such special sessions with uh, IJL. Uh, as Dr. Rajib explained uh, the purpose of uh, uh, IJL, what we found at IGBC is that it's it's so much matching and it's very we are like a very natural partner and we must come together and host uh, events in this momentous year. India uh, IGBC Indo Japan Business Council is established in 2005, um, 2011 and since then we are main <laughs> to bring people together, improve the people to people connect and make sure there is a lot of lot of uh, conversation happening uh, between them because if any business or any advancement has to happen it has to start with understanding uh, people from each side so that's what igbc uh, is doing and this effort is also one of those uh, efforts that we are pu uh, putting in i welcome all of you and I will also request you to stay tuned with us through this entire year uh, for different programs and diff listening to the different eminent personalities and their views about India and Japan relationship. <laughs> Today is not a time for me to speak more. It's time to hand it over back to Kaone San. But before that, definitely a very, very big thanks to IJL, uh, Dr. Rajiv Shah, to Kaone San for providing this opportunity to collaborate with you and host this wonderful uh, event. Thank you very much. 
and I welcome all the eminent speakers of today. I look forward to hearing you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, now, first of all, I would like to request the uh, uh, Indo-Japan Business Council to play the recorded video of uh, His Excellency, Mr. Sanjay K. Varma, Ambassador of India to Japan, please. Distinguished guests, friends, ladies and gentlemen, Namaskar, Konnichiwa. A very good evening to all of you. I'm delighted to be invited by the India Japan Business Council and India Japan Laboratory at Kyo University to speak at the opening session of the online lecture series celebrating 70 years of India Japan diplomatic relationship. I will attempt at presenting my views on India-Japan, how near, how far. I hope through this speech, I'll be able to whet your appetite to understand India as well as the future of India-Japan partnership. India regards Japan as its close and natural partner. India-Japan bilateral partnership rooted in history and tradition enjoy the status of a special strategic and global partnership. This partnership is based on the strong foundation of shared objectives and common values such as democracy, freedom and respect for rule of law. In today's world, the growing convergence in India-Japan partnership on strategic and economic issues has immense potential to shape a peaceful, secure and sustainable world. This year, on 28th April 2022, we mark the 70th anniversary of establishment of our diplomatic relations. As we look around and ahead at this important milestone, we see many new avenues for India-Japan cooperation. India-Japan partnership is reflected in vast array of institutional mechanisms we have established. Annual summit, foreign ministers' strategic dialogue, Defense Ministerial Dialogue, 2 plus 2 Ministerial Dialogue, and many more. In the most recent telephone call between Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi, and Prime Minister Kishida, which happened in October last year, the leaders agreed to further enhance and elevate our strategic partnership in a variety of areas, including high technology and futuristic sectors. There is clear synergy between India's and Japan's vision for the Indo-Pacific region. When we see alignment between India's activist policy, our Indo-Pacific vision based on the principles of Sagar and Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, and that of Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific vision. Japan and India are also jointly exploring, working together in third countries of South Asia and Africa to make use of our complementarity. Our bilateral strategic partnership is concretized in plurilateral engagements such as Quad and Supply Chain Resilience Initiative. Let me talk a little bit about Quad first. To us, it is a partnership for global good. We are four democracies, market economies, and pluralistic societies committed to the vision of a free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific. We share the values of respect for rule of law, sovereignty, and territorial integrity, and freedom of navigation. Quad summits have highlighted our shared commitment in areas such as climate change, COVID-19 vaccine development and distribution, critical and emerging technologies, outer space, cybersecurity, connectivity, infrastructure development, counterterrorism, and maritime security. The Quad partnership is one of the ways in which we could address geopolitical challenges in the Indo-Pacific region. Another important avenue of partnership is SCRI, which is Supply Chain Resilience Initiative. The launch of SCRI amongst India, Japan, and Australia 
is aimed at securing end-to-end -end supply chains, reducing over-reliance on a single geography, peaceful resolution of disputes, respect for international law, including those reflected in UNCLOS, and opposition to unilateral attempts to change their status quo through use of force or coercion. Defense and security cooperation has emerged as one of the most important pillars of India-Japan partnership and an important factor in ensuring peace and stability in the region. There has been an increase in frequency of defense exchanges at the highest levels. India is looking at defense production and with the help of Japanese advanced technology, both countries can immensely benefit in becoming self-reliant in defense products. Japan continues to play an important role in India's economic growth story. The expanse of our partnership extends into every socio-economic sector. Particularly noteworthy are infrastructure development, information and communication technology and digitalization, energy, outer space, food processing, science and technology, healthcare, and research and development cooperation. Japan's long-standing foreign direct investment footprint in India is steadily expanding. Today it covers 1,455 companies, with more than half of them engaged in manufacturing. New industrial collaborations are in the making even as we speak. Looking ahead, complementarity between the two countries can facilitate new, innovative and alternate models of partnership. To make this possible, both countries need to come together to co-innovate, co-create and co-produce for both domestic markets but as well as going global. This will combine our strengths and competitiveness together. Pharmaceuticals, medical device manufacturing and research and development hold a promising future for India-Japan collaborations. India is the pharmacy of the world and the Japanese research and development can provide affordable, safe and quality medicines and diagnostic equipments. In context of Japan's Avin and India's Ayushman Bharat, we are exploring cooperation in areas such as Ayurved, Yoga, Wellness and developing high standard healthcare systems. India-Japan Digital Partnership is the cornerstone of our convergence in digital area in view of synergizing between Japan's Society 5.0 policy and India's Digital India, Startup India and Skill India initiatives. The digital partnership has been recently renewed for, to further cooperation in startups, corporate sector, ESDM, digital talent exchange, research and development and security related strategic collaborations. With rapidly increasing active internet users in India, opportunities in front frontier technologies of 5G and beyond 5G, big data analytics, quantum computing, blockchain, internet of things, telecom security, and submarine optical fiber cable system are under various phases of implementation. We have wide-ranging cooperation with Japan to promote science and technology in the areas of life sciences, material sciences, high energy physics, biotechnology, healthcare, methane hydrate, robotics, alternative source of energy, and earth sciences. Indian Space Agency, ISRO, and Japanese Space Agency, JAXA, are also pursuing future cooperative activities in the use of exploration of outer space exclusively for peaceful purposes, disaster mitigation, and lunar missions. Both sides are also collaborating in nuclear energy and nuclear technology under the 2017 Civil Nuclear Agreement. India and Japan are also exploring collaborations in critical minerals and new and emerging strategic technologies that are shaping the future of our two countries, but indeed for the entire world. We continue to deepen cooperation on people-to-people -people exchanges and human resource development. There are more than 12,500 Indians in Japan who are highly skilled and they hold highly skilled 
visas among a total of over 40,000 Indians living in Japan. We are focusing on human resources capacity building through 17 Japanese Institute of Manufacturing and seven Japanese endowment courses aimed at skilling people in Japanese work culture and processes. In addition, after the success of technical intern training program with Japan, the signing of memorandum of cooperation on a specified skilled worker is a promising enabler of skills matching and exchanges. We are also working to overcome the challenges of language barrier by establishing Japanese language schools in India. Over 300 linkages have been established between Indian and Japanese universities. In the end, I would like to emphasize that India-Japan partnership is shaping the contours of regional peace, stability, and prosperity. It would not be wrong to claim that India and Japan are key to the much wanted international geostrategic stability. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you all happiness and health. Dhaniwad. Namaskar. Arigato gozaimasu. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it was very nice to receive this uh, message from His Excellency Mr. Sanjay K. Varma, Ambassador of India to Japan, to open our session first session for this IJBC, IJL Memorial Lectures. So now I would like to invite the second speaker for Ambassador, Ambassador of Japan to India, Mr. Hiroshi Hirabayashi. Hirabayashi Sensei is particularly well qualified to discuss India and its growing role in the world. In addition to his ambassadorial duties in India, Hirabaya Sensei held posts in Italy, France, China, Belgium, and the United States, worked in Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and served as a cabinet counselor for external affairs for the Prime Minister's Secretariat. He is currently the president of the India-Japan Association, which was established in 1903. His first-hand accounts from his diplomatic experiences qualifies him as the best witness to discuss the evolution of India-Japan bilateral relations. His most recent publication is India, the Last Superpower, published by Aleph Publications in the month of April 2021. So now I would like to invite Mr. Hiroshi Hirabayashi, Thank you very much. Daniel Wadu Kawane san, Professor Rajib Shao, Mr. Desmond. Thank you very much for giving me this precious occasion. I'd like to uh, present two aspects of our relationship today. First, the how I perceive India as the last superpower, the future superpower. Secondly, a little bit of bilateral relationship. However, his Excellency the Ambassador Varma has presented you uh, in details how we are uh, in our bilateral relations. So I will be touching only on the major aspects. So I'd like to use my uh, PowerPoint. You can see this PowerPoint? Hi. Okay. Yes, yes, very well. Thank, Thank you. you very much. How to move on? Let's see. Okay. Uh, th this is a map of India and some major aspects of India, but 
the I skip this to the next page. In my viewpoints, there are five basics to know about India. The first scale of the nation, the surface, as well as the land mass. The land mass is equivalent to the land mass of European Union. Second aspect of India is India is observing unity in diversity. India is diverse in all its aspects. People, history, religion, uh, local or history and others. However, India keeps always a unity. The third, India is uh, what we call world's largest democracy. Largest means in terms of the population, in, time, in terms of the participants to the democratic process. Fourth, India is, no, is well known as traditionally pro-Japanese nation. There are several uh, reasons for that. The spiritual bonds, uh, especially uh, the introduction of Buddhism in the sixth century from uh, India. Japan's contribution to India's independence and India's high regard for Japanese as a model for nation building. Fifth, the strategic and geopolitical importance of India to Japan, of Japan to India. Next, I will mention some reasons why I perceive India will be the last superpower. India is a large, great power now. However, it is my conviction that in two decades, or at the latest in three decades, India will become a superpower. Fourth superpower, if I may say, US, China, Russia. China and Russia are uh, authoritative regimes, which are not very loved in the world. However, uh, objectively speaking, China and Russia may be categorized as superpowers. First elements of India, uh, first qualification of India to become a superpower. Number one, big country as, high, as I mentioned, big space and big population, increasing population, and more and more educated population. Secondly, India uh, honors its tradition of so-called strategic autonomy. India doesn't like to be allied with any power. India has many friends. Uh, however, India is not uh, allied to any power, strategic autonomy, and which is accompanied with military power, including nuclear deterrence. When I was posted in India in 1998, I was greeted by nuclear tests of India. Japanese and many other countries don't like uh, India becoming a nuclear power. However, uh, objectively speaking, uh, the possession of nuclear deterrence is one of the qualifications uh, as a superpower. Third, India's international influence in the United Nations and other multilateral organizations. Fourth, as I told you, the largest democracy and unity in diversity. Fifth, which is very important in my viewpoints, is great cultural tradition and a strong identity as a great nation. So India is becoming uh, in the future, not in a so distant future, a superpower. And in my view, India will be the last superpower. Why is that? 
There are many countries which are great, which are big, like uh, Brazil, Indonesia. Maybe Japan may be categorized among them. However, all of these powers, uh, big powers, are lacking in some aspects of the five elements which I have mentioned. For example, Japan abhors to have the nuclear deterrence. However, India's path to superpower is not so easy. First, India has to grow economically. Uh, through Make India, Skill India campaigns, or deregulation of the system, foreign direct in investment, and as Ambassador said, uh, infrastructure building. Second, India has to attack social reform. In my view, the most important is the fight against caste system. India's unique system. Indian successive governments have been working for eradicating or at least reducing the plight of uh, the lower caste people. But as uh, this system is deeply associated with Hinduism, it, it is pretty very difficult to get rid of the, this one. However, to be a superpower, especially honorable superpower, India has to reduce the plight of uh, the lower caste people or to get rid of uh, the prejudice coming from the system. Poverty alleviation, removal of corrup uh, corruption, respect of secularism, especially respect of secularism. Secularism in, is India's uh, long established tradition. But nowadays, uh, excessive uh, Hinduism is now being advocated by some people in India, deepening the rift between Hinduism and Islamism. Uh, India is expected to work on this issue. Ex in external relationship, India uh, has also to work on several uh, fronts. First, strategic partnership with major powers, major powers, US, European Union, and Japan. I'll be touching on the importance of Quad later. Secondly, India has to manage well with China, which is more and more aggressive or assertive, not only Eastern uh, part of uh, the uh, Western part of uh, Pacific, but Indian in Indian Ocean and beyond. Thirdly, India has to keep good neighborly policy. Of course, in any region, the neighbors are living uh, sometimes with animosity to each other. India is a big power in South Asia, which is causing some problems with her neighbors but India has to work on good uh, neighborly relationship. Fourth, as I told you, influence in, in international society. And on this front, I will be uh, stressing the importance of uh, Japan-India cooperation uh, in the pursuit of the vision of Indo-Pacific or Indo-Pacific strategy, which should be combined with the Act East policy of Mr. Narendra Modi. And India's, India's influence will be extending beyond its shores by constructing, by improving the connectivity uh, to ASEAN countries, on the Eastern Front, on the Western Front, to the Middle East and Africa. So this is uh, a map of my uh, making. Uh, China's 
the advancement into uh, East and South China Sea, a second and uh, a first and the second uh, inland, uh, uh, island chains. China is going to the south uh, through Bangladesh, Myanmar on the eastern side, uh, through Pakistan on the uh, Pacific, uh, on the western side. And the influence of China into Sri Lanka will be completing what we call uh, the necklace of a pearl, which is giving many trouble to India. China's one belt and one road uh, strategy is uh, being further extended. How to uh, check this Chinese advancement is uh, a common uh, headache for all of us. Uh, I shift to our bilateral relations uh, without coming into details. When I was in India as ambassador, uh, as I told you, I was greeted unluckily by nuclear tests of India. I worked for two years roughly to recover, to restore our relationship. And the relationship was uh, almost completely restored by the visit of Prime Minister Yoshiro Mori in August 2000. Yoshiro Mori and uh, Prime Minister Atal uh, Vajipai launched what we now call Global Partnership for the 21st century. That means Japan and India ha have to be uh, not limiting uh, their resources uh, only to the bilateral relations. We have to work for the benefits of the global, uh, global, partner, uh, global community. So global partnership, which was later enhanced and upgraded to uh, strategic and global partnership by Koizumi, Prime Minister Koizumi and uh, Dr. Mamanshin and further upgraded by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and Prime Minister Narendra, Narendra Modi to special strategic and global partnership. And this uh, three adjective uh, honoring uh, partnership have produced uh, an important initiative, which is called the Open and Free Indo-Pacific Strategy. Professor uh, Taniguchi was one of the great contributors to this vision. I leave this uh, part of uh, our relationship to Professor Taniguchi. A recent uh, bilateral, bilateral relationship I'll be touching uh, uh, briefly. Please uh, refer to this uh, map. Japan and the India are working on several big projects. Since several years, uh, between Delhi and Mumbai, the so-called dedicated flight corridor is being constructed. 1,500 kilometers uh, freight uh, railway system. Along this freight railway system, it is expected uh, that 24 industrial and commercial clusters uh, will be created. Now there, uh, this project is going on already. Among, uh, uh, along uh, this 1,500 kilometers, 500 kilometers between Ahmedabad of Gujarat and Mumbai. The construction of Shinkansen system is going on. On the other hand, uh, in the south of India, between Bangalore, Bengaluru, and Chennai, 
500 kilometers of industrial corridor is being planned. More recently, on the northeastern front of India, seven uh, relatively small states of India on the northeastern part of India, they have been left behind uh, the main uh, Indian continent because of probably the distance, because of the difference of maybe race. Anyway, uh, seven states are being now much better connected to West Bengal and through West Bengal to other states of India. Japan is asked by India to be a partner, to be a, a cooperation partner to develop the seven states of uh, North Indian states. This is very important, not only for the seven states themselves, it is very important to create a connectivity, a route, land route to ASEAN, into Myanmar and through Myanmar to Thailand, Vietnam and others. Now, uh, there is a maritime connection, maritime connectivity between India and ASEAN uh, from uh, Chennai, Vishakapatna, uh, Kolkata to Bangkok and others. If the land connectivity on the east, east, uh, northeast part of India will be uh, developed with Myanmar. That will make this uh, connectivity not half round, but the full round type of strategic uh, partnership. This is the idea of Japan and India uh, who are working jointly, actually. And beyond uh, this initiative, Japan uh, and India working to extend uh, Indo-Pacific initiative, Indo-Pacific vision to Africa. Indo-Pacific uh, region is considered to be the most important region in the world geopolitically, geoeconomically, and others. The shift of gravity of global politics and the economy are now shifting from the, the Atlantic to the Pacific through Indian Ocean. But Japan and India are not satisfied only with this they have made a common a mutual pledge to work for the development of Africa. Because uh, India is strong in eastern part of Africa, in eastern part and south, southern part of Africa, traditionally. So if we join the resources of Japan, technology and the capital, and the resources of the human network of India uh, in East and South Africa. Not only African countries will be benefiting, but also uh, Japan and India and their partners will be benefiting uh, also. This is a very important uh, vision, which is now being uh, worked on. Finally, I'll be touching on uh, the quad, quadrilateral uh, partnership among Japan, US, Australia, and India. This is a photo which was taken September last year uh, in the White House with Washington Monument in the background from left to right, Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Suga, Prime Minister Modi, President Biden, and Prime Minister Morrison, symbolizing the importance of the cooperation, strategic, strategic cooperation among four countries. 
this uh, quad is now uh, being supported supported by major European countries like UK, France, Germany, and others, especially UK and France, because they have deep and large strategic interest in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Diego Garcia is officially the British territory, which is rented to the American 7th Fleet. France has in the Southern Pacific, Polynesia and others, uh, their, uh, how to say, territories in the Pacific. So France considered herself as a, pa a Pacific power. So France and the uh, UK especially, uh, wants to cooperate with uh, India and Japan, Australia, and the United States. Finally, I'd like to touch on the people to pick people contact, comparing how Japan-India relationship in the people to people contact are behind Japan and China people-to-people uh, -people contact. In terms of uh, the visitors, uh, mutually visiting people, in terms of students, in terms of residents, in terms of uh, how many uh, students are learning Japanese, Indians or, or Chinese, if uh, the, the number of uh, bilateral flights. So this is before the uh, COVID-19 uh, erupted. However, uh, Japan is lagging far behind in her relationship with China, com uh, uh, in, in her relations with India compared to her relations with China. We have to work further on the promotion of people-to-people -people contact, a student's exchange, the increase of uh, foreign tourists. So finally, uh, I, 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 this is a propaganda from my part. I have written uh, a book titled The Last Superpower India. On the right side, Japanese edition. On the left side, uh, Indian edition. In Japan, I'm working uh, in Japan India uh, Association. We are publishing two bulletins. On the right hand side, uh, the monthly bulletin, collecting uh, very seriously written uh, articles by professors, scholars, and others. On the left side, monthly bulletin, which is a sort of uh, monthly reviews, which are enjoyed by the members of Japan India Association. Finally, uh, uh, for these two buttons, you can make an access to Japan India Association's website. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hirabaya Sensei, for your wonderful presentation. And uh, I'd like to now invite questions from the audience. And uh, uh, those who are keen to uh, present uh, questions, kindly use the reaction icons, uh, raise your hand, and let me, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Will you please, um, Mr. Paul Dupi? Dupi? Yes, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, please. Very Great. well. Good evening. Yeah. Konbawa good evening. and Konbawa. Namaste. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Sanjay Kumar Verma. It's nice to see you again. And of course, uh, Ambassador Hirabayashi and Professor Rajiv. I'm Paul Dupuy. I'm the CEO of Randstad. We are the world's largest staffing and recruiting company. 
For the past four years, I was the CEO of Randstad in India. And we had 75 locations in India. We had 65,000 people we put to work every day across the four corners of India. I enjoyed your presentation. I felt very uh, natsukashi watching. I'm now in Tokyo as the CEO of Randstad here in Japan. We are now working on bridging between India and Japan, particularly on bringing skilled workers, skilled labor oh, yes. from yes. India to Japan. And so my question is about that. I think uh, it's a huge opportunity to bridge between the two countries. And I'm wondering about your thoughts on what is the key trigger? How can we accelerate on this mission as Japan has a talent scarcity and India has lots of great talent? Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, you are, oh, yes. Thank you. You are right. Uh, 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 it is very important to increase our exchange of skilled, uh, technologically advanced people uh, between the two countries. Uh, Japanese uh, business community is well conscious of that. And uh, they are increasingly uh, inviting the IIT uh, students or alumni of IITs of India. And uh, uh, they are also sending their people uh, to IITs of India or to other academic institutions. And they are establishing more and more, how to say, research centers in various parts of India. And by doing so, they want to benefit uh, from uh, the intellectual resources, uh, technological resources of Indian people. Of course, uh, still uh, a language barrier is existent. Uh, the Japanese companies are not always uh, globally uh, developed, but I'm uh, convinced that uh, they are doing increasingly better jobs. And I'm very much optimistic. And if the United States is closing uh, the, the opportunity of Indian IITs and other uh, technologically advanced people by, by limiting the issuance of H1, how to say that, H1B visa, visa. Right. right. Then right. Japan will be, uh, will be a uh, beneficiary for that. Indian people will be tempted to come to uh, Japan in a great number, in greater numbers. So the, this Thank is- you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, thank, you thank you for you. the encouraging comments. And, and I wanted to just say to everyone, uh, the photo behind me is very special. You may recognize this is Ladakh in Northern India in the Himalayas. I'm a yeah. Canadian and I go to India oh. every year and I coach ice hockey. I coach the Indian national ice hockey team. This is a picture yeah. of my version of heaven. Two years ago, I was up there oh, with National oh. Geographic making a special yes. episode about climate change in the Himalayas. Yes. But thank you so yeah. much. Namaste. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Much. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for very uh, timely question. So now I'd like to invite uh, uh, another question, which actually uh, I received uh, one question in the chat box. So let me uh, read this uh, for on behalf of the person who is not able to turn the video on uh, from Mr. Naoyuki Watanabe. Thank you for your presentation, Ambassador Hirabayashi. As I'm not specialist of Indian diplomacy, could you kindly let me know if India has an intention to be a superpower? In my opinion, becoming a superpower also means taking huge responsibility for global politics and economy. Right. And I would like to know if India has a will to do so, please. Yeah. India, frankly speaking, uh, some Indians are still hesitant. But uh, in due course of time, like it or not, India will become a superpower because of several important elements I mentioned. 
and as India's strength, India's uh, influence will be increasing, I would hope that more and more Indians will become self-confident, will uh, feeling more responsibility as a great uh, superpower. And uh, luckily, India is observing democracy, freedom of speech and expression, and other uh, common values, not like China and uh, Russia. Uh, India will become a very honored, respected superpower. Uh, even the United, United States have, has many problems as a country divided uh, among the people. So uh, uh, India uh, should not be perfect to be superpower. Simply, I would hope that Indians will be feeling more responsibility of playing a global or a regional responsibility. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, now I'd like to ask uh, probably the last question for this session, if uh, I may ask. Okay, since there is uh, uh, no question coming, uh, Hirabaya Sensei, may I ask uh, one question? Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I would like to know uh, what could be the most uh, promising uh, way to increase people to people exchange for India and Japan relationship, which is quite lacking. What is your uh, opinion? Kindly let us know. Tourism, in my view, tourism. Yes. A uh, number of scholarships and others are, are limited, but by making easier the tourism on two directions, the number of uh, people who know uh, the other country will be increasing rapidly. In order to uh, promote uh, tourism, we have to ease or eventually eliminate entrance visas. Uh, we have to make much more uh, public relations in two directions. And of course, in, in, in India's case, I'd hope that India's uh, hygienical conditions medical conditions will be improving and India uh, uh, is expected to manage the security situation in India, especially vis-a-vis -vis foreigners, uh, because the not all the uh, tourists uh, know uh, the details of India. They are simply going to India to enjoy uh, beautiful sceneries, uh, the animals, uh, cultures, and others. But uh, they encounter from time to time some troubles. So I would hope uh, that uh, India continues to, to improve its living conditions, uh, security conditions, to ease the uh, visitors pass good time in India. Okay, thank you so much, sir. So uh, now I would like to conclude uh, Hirabaya Sensei's session, and I'd like to uh, invite uh, Taniguchi Sensei. Hirabaya Sensei, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Danyawad. So uh, now I'd like to introduce to you all uh, Dr. Taniguchi Tomohiko. Dr. Taniguchi is a professor at Keio University Graduate School of System Design and Management, reading international political economy and Japanese diplomacy. 
He was also special advisor to Prime Minister Abe Shinzo's cabinet until he stepped down in September 2020. He has also spent his 20 years with Nikkei Business, a weekly magazine, and joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 2005 as Deputy Press Secretary and Deputy Director General for Public Diplomacy. In 1999, the Foreign Press Association in London elected him president, the first from the east of Swedes, while he was a correspondent in London. During his career as a journalist, Dr. Taniguchi spent sabbaticals at Woodrow Wilson School, Princeton University, as a Fulbright Visiting Fellow, at the Shanghai Institute for International Studies and at the Brookings Institution as a paid fellow at the Center for Northeast Asian Policy Studies. He has attained the LLB from the University of Tokyo, doctorate in national security from Takushoku University. And one of his latest books entitled, if we, it is put into English, Truth to be Told of Abe Shinzo, that was his own account of Mr. Abe's leadership. His appearance on international media and prolific writing as a journalist, as well as an authority on international affairs has been remarkable. Dr. Taniguchi-sensei, please. Thank you, thank you, Kaunisan, that's too kind. I'm very much uh, flattered. And thank you very much for having me for this very much important occasion. My thanks especially must go to Rajib Shah, who has chosen me as one of the uh, inaugural speakers for this important series of lectures for the uh, two organizations and to, to commemorate the 70th anniversary of India-Japan relationship. And I'm very much uh, honored to be in the company of the two esteemed ambassadors, Mr. Hirabayashi and His Excellency, uh, Mr. Verma. I have always actually always been very much uh, keen to do whatever it takes to deepen and advance the relationship between India and Japan. That is in fact an object of my lifelong passion. Today, I would like to spend the next 20 minutes, roughly, talking to you about our shared past, as well as our shared future, one that young people from both countries should jointly work hard to usher in. Now, on this day of commemorating the 70th anniversary of India-Japan diplomatic relations, I must begin by looking back at the past in order for me to introduce, especially to young people in the audience, the speech that warmed many a heart amongst the Japanese. Japan regained independence by putting San Francisco Peace, Peace Treaty into effect in April 1952. So this year, it is actually also the 70th anniversary since the country left the Allied occupation. India. India uh, chose not to be a party of that treaty, maintaining that Japan should be treated more fairly, citing that the Okinawa Islands remained under the US administrative control, for instance. India instead rebuilt its formal diplomatic tie with Japan on a bilateral basis by forging its own peace treaty with Japan, which took effect also in the same year of 1952. Yet it took four more years for Japan to be admitted to the United Nations as a member country. It was Tuesday, 18th December, 1956, they, the United Nations General Assembly admitted Japan as a member by a unanimous vote. On that same day, Japan's national flag 
was hoisted for the first time after the war on foreign soil. It was the return of Japan to the international community that was long, long overdue. How much the Japanese rejoiced at the admission should be beyond our imagination. One can only imagine against that backdrop how much gratitude the Japanese representatives, headed by an experienced dip diplomat named Shigemitsu Mamoru, felt when the Indian representative welcomed the Japanese by delivering a speech. That Indian representative was VK Krishna Menon, one of the greatest founding fathers of independent India. And I now quote some of his remarks. The government of India desires to state at this moment that during the six years that Japan was under military occupation, it pressed for a generous, early and just settlement with Japan. The government of India was unable to sign the peace treaty of San Francisco for the reason that that multilateral treaty contained provisions which, in its view, did not afford the necessary position of honor and equality to the Japanese people. And therefore, we took early steps to conclude a separate peace treaty with Japan and terminate the state of war. Today, India has treaties of trade and friendship with Japan, and we hope these relations will continually increase. With the admission of Japan as a member of the United Nations, we are beginning a new period for that country, which on the fateful and unfortunate day of 27 May 1933, left the Committee of Nations by its withdrawal from the League of Nations. This is a signal, therefore, for a more united world, a world in which a great country of Asia, in the space of less than half a century, has emerged from an earlier civilization into all the equipment of modernity with great industries and developed its economic life and made itself a great power. Asia looks to Japan for its contribution to its own territorial neighborhood, as well as to the whole world in the technical, economic, and other fields. The countries of Asia and Africa were particularly glad to welcome Japanese delegation at Bandung in Indonesia last year, where that delegation played an important part. We were unanimous in expressing our sympathy and our feelings in regard to the atomic bombing of Japan during the war, the only country that suffered from this particular form of war punishment. And I unquote. It makes me feel very much humbled, realizing that from India, the Japanese heard such a heartwarming statement. I must quickly footnote also for young people in the audience that in India, the nation's elected officials have continued to pray for the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and done so without fail over these long periods of 70 years. One finds no nation other than India where parliamentarians have done anything remotely similar. Fast forward to the 21st century, may I also add a few words about the role Prime Minister Abe Shinzo played in enhancing India-Japanese strategic relationship because I witnessed the development close by. He was the one that first pushed forward in 2007, a concept of confluence of the two seas, the Indo-Pacific oceans. That was the genesis of our new geographic framework of Indo-Pacific that 
in the subsequent years would largely replace another concept of Asia Pacific, a product of the 1980s. By the time he spoke to the Central Hall audience of the Indian Parliament, August 2007, the latter Asia Pacific had been passé for it failed to conceptually capture the role India should play in decades to come. As for the idea of Quad, he was eager to have it well back in 2007. When he made the second coming as prime minister, he immediately ran an article for the web-based opinion publication of Project Syndicate under the title, Asia's Democratic Security Diamond, which according to his argument, should connect the four dots of Canberra, Delhi, Tokyo, and Hawaii. The diamond, or more humbly quadrilateral, is the single widest seascape envisioned as a political military sphere of partnership ever drawn in history. At the core of it lies a shared sense that in the face of challenges from an ever growing authoritarian regime, the four countries, especially its militaries, must firmly join hands together. One should not lose sight of that as it is the core identity of Quad. That much being about our past, remote and recent, I shall now turn my eyes toward the future. In thinking of what to be done, let us shoot for the moon and do so quite literally. In fact, it is not a moonshot project any longer. It is something that is going on now. Within the next two to three years, Indo-Japanese lunar exploration project will reach the South Pole area of the moon. The lander system that will make a pinpoint landing on the surface of the moon is being developed by the Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, while the automobile or the rover system that will rove in one of those permanently shadowed craters in search of water ice by Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA. At this point, may I say that one falls in love with Vidya Balan as easily as I actually did. She is an actress who has appeared in many Hindi films. And I would argue that you all must watch one of hers, a 2019 drama film, Mission Mangal, or in English, Mission Mars. Vidya plays a role of a lead Israel scientist who is also a dedicated wife and mom, who eventually brings India's first interplanetary expedition into an amazing success. The spirit one finds in the film of the only limit being literally the sky is what the Japanese engineers and scientists must borrow from their Indian colleagues who are substantially more optimistic in their world outlook than the Japanese. And nowhere else than in the field of space exploration is that forthcomingness more important. How nice it would be if JAXA could send more experts to Israel to let them be fully immersed in the optimism a la India. I should also suggest that both of our two prime ministers should highlight 
when they will meet in person soon in India, the significance of that lunar ice-breaking project to showcase to the rest of the world that on the cutting edge technological development, India and Japan run on the same edge. My second suggestion for our shared future is the extension of the first. India must develop a habit of mind of thinking Japan first and Japan vice versa in planning anything scientifically groundbreaking, which may range from quantum computing, advanced medicine, to game changers in military technologies. One area worth our close attention is nanotechnology and its development in India. Each year, one aspiring scientist is chosen in India as an awardee of Young Nano Scientist India Award. Last year in 2021, the awardee was an associate professor at the Bangalore-based Indian Institute of Science named Anijya Das. One of his papers he published as a lead author for Nature Nanotechnology has been cited 3,575 times, which is an awesome number. I have heard of any award in Japan. Uh, I have heard of no award in Japan given to aspiring scientists focusing on the field of nanoscience and nanotechnology. I know that around 570 students and researchers from India have visited Japan under the government-sponsored Sakura Science Program and HOPE meetings. Sakura being Japan's national flower, it is now time, isn't it, for Delhi and Tokyo to launch a reverse program naming it the Lotus Program and bring in Japanese scientists, ones in nanoscience in particular. To facilitate such cooperation in technological development, it is better than otherwise that India and Japan are treaty bound. Speaking of which, the one we have is quite old, called the agreement between the government of Japan and the government of India on cooperation in the field of science and technology, it dates to 1985. To embark on a joint journey for a new one, more, pay, uh, more pertinent to the reality of the day, uh, should bring experts of the two nations closer, which will be an important byproduct. Also of note, India and Japan should broaden its scope of cooperation in the development of military technologies. True, Indian Ministry of Defense and Japanese MOD signed on 31st July 2018 a tongue-twisting project arrangement concerning the cooperative research on the visual simultaneous localization and mapping based global navigation satellite system augmentation technology for unmanned ground vehicle and robotics. I would not say that that is not an ambitious project. That's an ambitious project. I would, however, wish to see more such joint projects in the pipeline. Military technology gives us more power for offense and equally importantly, more protection to our proud members of services. It counts as it is about life or death. That is exactly why India and Japan must work harder still to jointly develop military technologies. To do so, should create a linchpin 
that would bring the two nations ever closer on the crucial strategic front. My third and last suggestion is also about our shared defense. I see a set of questions raised increasingly by keen followers of our bilateral defense partnership, Indian as well as Japanese. What if, what if, a question goes, China should repeat what it did over the Himalayas in 1962. Would the Japanese come to rescue us? So that is what an increasing number of Indians wish to ask. Conversely, some in Japan might want to ask similarly, would India send its military to join forces with the Japanese and the Americans once the Senkakus and or Taiwan were under Chinese military strike? I would argue that scenarios such as those have for quite some time no longer been unthinkable. Prime Minister Kishida and Prime Minister Singh both must get prepared for each plausibility and start managing their expectations toward one another. It is not an easy task to keep expecting something undeliverable from the other party might likely invite utter disappointment toward one another. What is the level of expectations? One to be struck to better balance the still fledgling partnership. That must be dealt with on a constant basis by the two leaders. The leaders of both of our countries, I mean top leaders, must start getting prepared for the Chinese assault on either one of us or both of us and emotionally committed to what kind of responses they should take in case of real contingencies. What to be expected and what not, be, what not to be expected. What value India could give to Japan and Japan vice versa to India must be among the scenarios they must be equipped with and constantly able to update. That is worth doing because we're no longer just friends. We are partners. And as partners, we must always dance along with the same tune. That's it. I look forward to discussions. Thank you so much, Taniguchi Sensei, for inspiring speech. Uh, now I'd like to invite questions. So uh, if there is any question from the participants of this Zoom ring, will you kindly raise your hands using the icon? And uh, I would like to invite your questions. So meantime, uh, uh, there is uh, one question which actually is uh, uh, placed on YouTube. Uh, do you think India can act more responsibly as potential superpower than the United States, which is letting the world down by deserting troubled countries like Ukraine and Afghanistan? This is a person's view. How the present situation is being seen by Japan that has security alliance with the US? Is Japan feeling shaky? So this is exactly the uh, kind of question which we received on YouTube. How would you say, uh, Taniguchi Sensei, from your viewpoint? Well, it's not a question of um, you like or dislike your defense partner. Uh, there is actually little option other than Japan continuing to forge and improve its bilateral relationship militarily with the United States, given the circumstances. If Japan was in a place as New Zealand perhaps is, Japan could be very much a neutral uh, and uh, uh, country that is almost aloof from what's going on in the rest of the world. But Japan is 
sharing a border, borders with, if you can think about it, Russia, North Korea, China, none of which is democratic and all of which are nuclear powered. So uh, to ally with the United States is uh, something that Japan has chosen to do itself. And now it is up to Japan itself whether the United States is going to be incentivized in the future uh, to get engaged in this part of the world, Indo-Pacific, because Japan uh, accommodates the biggest ever military footprint, which is to say forward deployed forces of the United States outside their country. So uh, what Japan could, should do is going to affect the course trajectory to be followed by the United States. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, would you like to comment on uh, Taniguchi Sensei's lecture, uh, Rajiv Sensei, please? Can you unmute? unmute? Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Yes, please. sorry. Uh, no, no, I am. I am not in a like. I am not that qualified to <laughs> <laughs> to make any comment after this um, excellent presentation of Taniguchi Sensei. But I think uh, what he mentioned, uh, like one one thing, actually remains in my ear very much. That I think um, in his initial part, he mentioned that uh, India should be like uh, considering Japan first, and Japan should be considering India first. I think that is possibly a very, very important message which gives like why we are trying to do this India-Japan bilateral collaboration. And going back to your earlier point also, what you asked uh, Kawane-san to uh, Hirabayashi Taishi, that people-to-people -people connection. So one is of course this government-to-government -government diplomatic relation and another is more grassroots people-to-people -people connection. I think that combination of these both things will possibly bring us to the future. And for that, what we are trying to do with IJBC and IJL, that bringing the youth of these two country together, who will actually help us to bring our dream uh, in future, trying to make this um, India thinking that Japan first and Japan thinking India first. I think that's one of my main takeaway from this very specific uh, lecture. So thank you very much, Taniguchi Sensei, for this wonderful overview. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. So thank you so much. Uh, Taniguchi Sensei, uh, if I may ask uh, one question, please. Uh, I'd like to know what kind of uh, difference you see between say Indian approach and also how, how to say Japanese approach about uh, what you mentioned, optimistic, being optimistic in your interpretation, how it would help say Japanese people to relate to India as a country, as a people, as a culture. This I'd like to know from you, thank you. Well, that's something that you could say to us, Kamana san. <laughs> Oh, no. you're the you're the one you're the one who is very much unique uh, with your indian accent when you speak english you Thank sound you. like indian right yes, i can't yes. speak like you like as you do so uh, you know much much better than indian optimism than me but i've been uh, meeting a lot of uh, people from india and uh, something called the sky is the only limit applies much, much more to the Indian people. Poll after poll, whatever kinds of polls you, you talk about in Japan indicate that these people, people in Japan are a bunch of probably the least optimistic people in the world. It's, it's <laughs> Japanese national pastime to say, I'm pessimistic. I, I don't have confidence. And that's been persistent, even during the uh, gung ho era of Japanese high growth in the 1960s and 70s. That was the same. People <laughs> responded to the polls saying, No, I'm not optimistic, I'm pessimistic. 
So there is a huge bias, inherent bias among the, among the Japanese. And uh, I think it's, um, it's going to be an eye-opening experience if uh, someone from universities, from engineering labs, from major companies and could go to the Indian uh, research laboratories, for instance, to collaborate with Indian scientists and engineers. One thing that uh, they should bring back home from India is this, the uh, sense of optimism, sense that you can do that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to invite the Mr. Siddharth Deshmukh, who's raising hand to ask a question, please. Please unmute, yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Paniguchi uh, Sensei, for this wonderful uh, lecture. I really enjoyed thoroughly. Of course, uh, I enjoyed previous lecture by Hiravashi Sana. And this, my question is the combination of, you know, the his comment and uh, your comment. So we, we, we heard in first lecture, India's next superpower. Uh, probably the most of the Indians here who are listening to this lecture, they are happy to hear that, right? Uh, naturally, we Indians love to be praised. That's, we are Indian. And we like, we like to be praised and we like, we enjoy also, and we are shameless to say, yeah, please praise us. And we know our limitations to being a superpower and maybe we will be working in future also. My question here is, I would like to uh, hear your opinion. I, we all the time here, the Japan is attracting Indian engineers. Japan want uh, Indian people to come there. Japan want Indian help and all, but this is all government is saying, right? Most of the time, the private enterprises still doesn't think actually the Indian engineers can help or the Indian uh, Japanese business still don't think that if they don't put up a shop in India, they can still survive. Or for them, the, the hurdles are so high than the market potential. While as we, 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 we see other people, so it's not only for the Japanese uh, corporate, the hurdles are high. I'm sure it's the same for Korean, it's the same for Taiwan, it's the same for American, for anybody, anybody, right? Because Indians are Indians, they will not change for anyone so easily. So my point is that when you are, we, are, we are having optimistic uh, view in a government quarters, in diplomacy, and we, are, we hear prominent personalities like uh, Hiravesh San that uh, 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 India will be next superpower. But what exactly we like organizations or uh, in India and Japan should do to explain to the people or that it's a time to keep the opinions aside and actually make visit or actually do something. What are the one, two suggestions that you can, actionable suggestion you can give us? And what is your opinion about this thought process? I have been as much frustrated by this phenomenon as you are. The slowness of um, Japan's uh, getting benefited from the talent pool of the Indians, which is actually enormous. If you compare the situation in, in, in Japan with that in the United States, for instance, um, in Silicon Valley, you get a huge number of Indian experts. And in the medical profession, almost all the doctors are Indians in the United States. So uh, familiar, familiarity does matter. Uh, there is a low level of familiar, familiarity, I would say, among the Japanese uh, engineers and Japanese uh, company executives. So it'll change uh, by, uh, as time goes by. But in order for those to change, in order for that sentiment to be changed, I think that's very much important to think about that Japanese corporates have become extremely risk averse. So it's not just about whether they should benefit from Indians. It's also about what kind of digital transformation they should embark upon, what kind of innovative uh, technologies they should, in, they should uh, 
they should use. On all those accounts, you know that the Japanese companies are risk averse. So much so that if you look at the amount of cash and deposits stored safely in the corporate balance sheet, that amounts to 60% of the nation's GDP. I have been deeply troubled by that. It's evidence that Japanese company executives are not spending money for creative purposes. So that's the one that must first be changed. And uh, if uh, they are very much keen on taking advantage of new sets of technologies, I mentioned nanotechnology, uh, medical science, uh, physics, and uh, uh, AI, and so on and so forth, they will encounter like it or not, Indian scientists and engineers, because they are a dominant force throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for your Thank you. Uh, Kawane-san, please un unmute yourself. Sorry. So it's really mind-blowing uh, lecture, as well as uh, answers from uh, Dr. Tomohiko Taniguchi. Thank you so much for your participation. And we are really, really honored to have you from Keio University. And I think uh, Dr. Rajiv Shaw's choice was just right. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Abhishek Chaudhary from uh, Indo-Japan Business Council, please. Uh, kindly make a concluding remark of the occasion. Thank you. Thank you, kawane -san. First of all, good evening, everyone. This is a wonderful session. So many interesting things, interesting experiences, insights. And the last point that you mentioned, uh, the 60% of GDP, this is something incredible. So uh, without taking much time, uh, let me start thanking each and every one all who has participated and make this event successful. First of all, I thank His Excellency Ambassador Sanjay Kumar Barmaji, Ambassador of India to Japan for accepting our invitation and shared his speech with us. We thank His Excellency Ambassador Hiroshi hirabayashi san former Ambassador to India and France, Chairman of JFSS and Professor Tomihiko Taniguchi Sensei, Special Advisor to Prime Minister Shinjo Abe's cabinet for taking your precious time out and the cons consenting to be our guest and share, sharing your valuable thoughts. Sir, indeed your words have inspired all of us. And I think this is going to be the new beginning of arranging people to people connect and we will definitely be at our at the newer heights of our relationship we also thank indian embassy in japan japanese embassy in india for supporting us for this lecture series a special thank to consulate general of japan in mumbai for continuously supporting us for the last few years professor Rajiv Sensei, without you and your team of IJL KU University, arranging this lecture was not possible. So thank you, thank you very much for all your support. And now comes the bridge or the pulia, Tomo, uh, Tomo Kawane-san. Kawane-san, thank you very much for helping us connect with KU University, arranging everything and making this event successful. Special thanks to Mr. Siddharth Deshmukh, President of IJBC for leading this effort from the front and our other team members, Thanashri San, for organizing this wonderful session. I must not forget to thank our sponsors, Tutor Bharat and Interjust India. We have event partners, Shimbi Labs, Nanobiz India Private Limited, Rao and MR, Vaivan Company, Ichiban Enterprise, Asian Community News, The Lingo, 
and KU University. Thank you, everyone. No event is successful without participants. So thank you each and everyone who has participated in this lecture using Zoom or YouTube link. And also thanks to all of those future viewers who will be viewing this using YouTube link. Last but not the least, I thank everyone who is directly or indirectly related to IJBC and IJL to keep our spirit going. Once again, thank you. Thank you very much for taking me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so all. It was very nice. Yes. <laughs> hey. Thank you. The next yeah. session. So I would say that today's session is concluded, but however, we are going to come back again with our first panel discussion, which will be on translation, interpretation, career opportunities and challenges. Our finalist will be Ms. Yoko Deshmukh, JTF Certified Freelance Translator, Mr. Salil Vaidya, Head of Japan BU at Rika and Technology Pune, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Rami Joshi, CEO and Founder of Fujiwara Japanese Consultant. This session will be on 5th March, Saturday, 4 p.m. India time and 7.30 p.m. Japan time. So for more details and registrations, please visit on our website. Again, we are going to have our next lecture series with IGL collaboration that will be on 23rd April 2022, 4 p.m. IST, 7.30 p.m. GST. The session will be on information, technology, innovation, and industries. And the speakers will be Mr. Yukiko Thakeyari, Senior Researcher at KU University, Mr. Siddharth Deshmukh, President of India Japan Business Council. So I again thank you very much for participating. Till then, stay tuned and stay healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi. 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 <laughs> 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 <laughs>